I just um, got the privilege of being able to introduce RJ. And I'll tell you, not only is he an amazing human, he's a great friend, he's a great coach, he's a great mentor. Um, he was someone when I um, just had a million questions that I knew he was safe, that I could reach out to, that he would um, give me real truth, that he would speak truth in love. Um, I appreciate that about him. Um, we go way back from our days when I was in Puyallup and um, through NBC camps. But the, it was probably 10 years ago that I said to him, like, can we just decide wherever you're at when my kids graduate, that's where they're going to go play basketball. And he said, he said yes at that time, but we, we, we're missing two of the three. So maybe the third time's a charm. So we'll see. So uh, take it away, RJ. Super excited to have you here. I am uh, elated to be here this morning, especially when I look in the chat and I see uh, coaches that I've looked up to since I was eighth, ninth grade. I see Coach Tim Kelly in here, a coach that when he walked in the gym as a young player, he just marveled at how he was able to coach his teams. Um, I I'll start off by saying this. Um, I don't solicit speaking engagements. I just kind of, it just kind of happens the way I kind of run my life. And when I say run my life, it's because I, I do have some systems that I use to make sure I stay, stay on, on point when I'm doing different things. If you're on this call this morning, then I think we can agree on this, that we are, we are living in some extraordinary times, right? And there is an avalanche of, of information coming down to us, but then a property of wisdom of how to handle some of this information. And uh, it seems like there's a hundred different coaching systems that can make your culture better. There's a thousand books on Amazon, on Audible, in one category on, you know, enhancing your leadership. You know, there's resources out there that quote unquote are made to make us better at what we do. And one thing that I wrote in my journal yesterday was, the unlimited resource that we have is ourselves. We will never run out of us. And so that's the resource we must invest in the most. Because it's like if you go find a leadership book, right, that you really love, and you put that leadership book into your leadership paradigm, and you walk around, and this is how you build your culture from these three steps. If you don't embody that, you, the people you're leading will, will see the holes in it. And so, you, so, you, so your leadership, I'm telling you, has to come from your core. When I say your core, it's got to come from right here. I mean, that's where your culture is at. Culture is not a building. It's not a buzzword. It's not a pamphlet. It's not a book. It's you. And, 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 I, and I'm telling you why I believe this is because I've worked in several different environments where, where, where we talk culture, where we preach culture. But the main conduit of teaching the culture, if he or she was contagiously negative, then no matter what happened, there was always a bend uh, to the negative angle. So for me, I really, really hone in on the self-care of who we are as individuals before we step out of our house. I told my players just the other day, when you wake up in the morning, I want you to visualize who you want to be like the grandest Jeff Jameson you could ever be, the best De Dennis Bauer you could ever be. And don't get your butt out of bed till you believe you can be that. So if that means you gotta stay in bed one more minute and visualize this is who I'm gonna be, this is who I wanna be. Once you visualize that, get out of bed and make it happen. I think a lot of times we wake up and we feel the weight of the world on our shoulders because of responsibilities we have. And, that, and that's good because we care. We don't want to wake up, well, I don't care what it, because we care. But the responsibilities that you have and the stress that comes from that, that is good stress. One, one thing I, that I've learned is this, this thing called expanded resiliency. And I haven't really heard of the phrase, so I'm kind of like throwing two words together. But how, what it means to me, and I think you as an athletic director, as uh, um, the attitude directors of your environment, Here's what I mean when I say expanded resilience. So if you have a rubber band and you have it on your wrist and then you pull it as far as it can go, it will always be able to handle that stress for the rest of the duration of that rubber band. 
If it wants to go further, you got to pull a little further. So anything between the beginning of that rubber band and the middle of that rubber band, it's already proved it can handle that stress. I say that to say this, I think a lot of the things that we worry about and concerned about are fearful issues of the future that may never happen, are worried about things in the past that we cannot fix, so we get paralyzed in the present that we are living. And then we end up coaching and leading unstable because we're like, I, I wish I would have done this, but this is gonna happen. And then you spend the entire presence planning. We have a generation of leaders that spend their entire life planning what they will do when they become a leader. And in the planning of what they would do to become the leader, I believe one major thing is missing. What are you? Who are you? If you can answer the question of who you are, I mean, you can answer the question to what your leadership is. That's the one question that answers everything in your life. For example, if someone says, who, who am I? And I say, my name is Coach RJ Barsh. That immediately tells you the sum of my existence is wrapped up in my coaching. I am a coach. That's what I do. I, I don't, there's no on and off switch to coaching. Or I'm Dr. So-and-so. Or I'm, so we, we, we begin to put our existence into these titles. And here's what I've realized. For adults, that's good. But for eighth grader, 10th grader, they don't care about your title. They care about is your, what's your energy like when I walk in the room? That's what they're reading. That's what they're, that's what they're understanding. Um, can you talk to me in 140 characters or less in 60 seconds or less? It is a generation of attention span. If you can't find a way to do that, I'm saying that's what you should study because that's the heartbeat of this generation right now. And I think we're learning that. Think about this. Before this quarantine and COVID stuff, we would tell our student athletes, put your phone down, get off the computer. Now we are begging them to Zoom. <laughs> we, you know, get on Zoom, I wanna see your face. So the thing that we ostracize is now the thing that we uh, enjoy. Because in the middle of both of those things is a connection uh, uh, to people. And so um, a couple of things that we'll talk about, and I'll get my screen share here. Let me see here, resume share. I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint. Everybody see that? Give a thumbs up anywhere. All right, so I never give the same speech twice. I've had tons of Zooms that I've been on. I made this last night after watching a couple of the uh, Wassa Wednesdays you guys have had. I love to play this game. The two truths and a lie. We are drowning in information, starved for wisdom. I believe that's the truth, right? And I believe that's the truth. We are living in extreme times, and whether good or bad, how you, you shake it, I believe that is the truth as well. But here's the, here's the lie that most type A personalities, most athletic-driven uh, uh, people uh, feel like self-care is selfish. And what I mean by that, uh, I was listening to the podcast with the Tumwater AD last night. And Cole, you, you were talking to him, and he, and, he, and he mentioned that he was in coaching, and the AD job came open. He didn't want to really leave coaching, but he also knew how much he could bring to the department if he went and became the AD. And so, so basically, every single AD had sacrifices something for the greater good. I mean, that's, the only, that's the reason you became an AD. You don't get to call the play. You don't get to, to uh, go recruit the kids. I mean, you just shouldn't be recruiting in high school. You don't get to do any of that. You get to sit in the shadow of the greatness. And then it's crazy because most of your emails are complaints. And the parent doesn't call and say, you did a great job hiring that coach. So imagine if you work for a full year and good things happen and you're not patted on the back. Bad things happen and you're slapped in the face. Over time, if you don't know how to have self-care, the residue of all those relationships and all those experiences will make you angry. It's kind of like this story I heard the other day that this, this, this grandpa was babysitting his grandkids, right? And they're over his house, like, kind of like Dave. Right? He has his three, three little boys, I think, over the house last night. 
And, and so the grandpa, he falls asleep. And, and the three little boys are looking at grandpa and they're like, oh my gosh, grandpa asleep. So they go into the pantry and they find this putty and it says stinky, smelly putty. And they take this stinky, smelly putty and they put it right here on grandpa's nose, right here, right in front of him. And so when grandpa wakes up, he's like, man, it stinks in this room. And then he gets up and he walks into another room. Man, it stinks in this room too. Then he goes outside. He's like, man, it stinks in here. And after about 20 minutes, he's like, man, it stinks everywhere. Because he didn't realize that he was carrying the stink with him. And oftentimes that's what happens in our, in our communication is if you don't have self-care, we hold on to those negative conversations. You know, I don't know why we don't hold on to the positive ones better. I think the human condition is wired weird that we don't do that. I wish we would do that, but we don't hold on to the positive ones nearly as much. Uh, so here's a practice that I do uh, twice a week, usually Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's thankful Thursday, thankful Tuesday. I literally yesterday got on my phone and I called uh, a young lady who um, did all the rentals for me when I was a head coach in, in, in Lakeland, Florida at Southeastern University. And I called her just to say, thank you for helping us get our leases when I was a head coach there. 10 seconds. You would have thought, I said, you just won the lotto. The lady almost cried on the phone in 30 seconds. That shows me the power of patting someone on the back when you don't have to. So I would admonish you today, write down three people you would pat on the back. And here's the three people I want you to pat on the back. If you are uh, Debbie Bent Bentler, I want you to write your name down three times. Because today, you're giving yourself a compliment. And that's okay. Today, you're saying, you know what? It's 8 o'clock, and I'm on a Zoom to be a better athletic director. That deserves that. Because in extreme times, if our self-care is good, our environments will breathe in that energy. And so the most important thing that I believe when it comes to, comes to uh, this rant that I'm on, and most of my speeches sound like rants, so pick up something wherever you can, is uh, understanding your why. So the COVID stuff happens. We were in Las Vegas. We had just lost to San Diego State in the semifinals. Uh, we had won 20 games after losing uh, 20 the year previously. We were jumping on the plane and headed back. Uh, we had a week before we would figure out if we were going to the NIT, which is it would be a big deal for us. Uh, we had a team meeting, and uh, we decided that we were going to go as hard as we could for that last week in pre preparation for the NIT. Of course, we all know we get that call. Season's over. Immediately, it's a response to our players. Now, this is where your why becomes important. Because the why can take the information that's extreme and apply it to the scenario and to give hope. If you know who your why, if you know your why. And so I'm going to show you a short little two, three minute video that will help you understand your why. And then we will, we'll, we'll talk about um, what I mean by this. What I mean about that critical conversation, because you only really get that conversation one time. The coach just lost the biggest game of the season. He's walking down the hallway, and here you come as an AD. What do you say in that moment? Can be the most critical conversation for that relationship. I mean, he's going to be fine after the game when he wins the championship. He might not walk in the hall for an hour. He's getting the high fives in the gym. But the conversation for the softball coach when she's driving home and her best player got hurt, and you call to check, what that crucial conversation now, there's rules to those conversations, like you'll see in this video, but if you understand your why, I guarantee you, you'll be able to understand how to have that conversation. So we'll watch this, we'll come back, and when we come back, we'll talk about some of the other current issues that are happening in America. is called how do I know and a lot of times when people hear the phrase how do I know the next thing they say is what how do I know what but the key really isn't to know what the key is to know why because when you know your why you have options on what your what can be for instance my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose 
My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular I'm about to show you a clip to. We were in, uh, we were in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you the clip. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so... Um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, "Amazing Grace." Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That bro could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right. All right. Now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. So the thing about that is we discover our why way before we figure out our what. So DJ Hetsley is on this call. There was a time at a camp in eighth or ninth grade where he decided in his heart, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. He didn't understand what he was asking for, but he knew the feelings he was getting from the people around him that made him say, this is why I want to do this. Because I see this coach saying this, and he made me feel this way, and I see this teacher, she said this to me, and it is fine. The why makes the how so beautiful. The important thing about our why, though, is once we mature in information, we get so paralyzed in the how that we lose our why. And then when extreme times come, Black Lives Matter rally, an officer kneels and he's not kneeling to pray, he's kneeling on somebody's neck. How do you respond to that as an athletic director if your how has turned into, let me just add myself to this website and watch this course, or let me read this book to figure it out. No, 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 no. You got into this business, you got into this profession because you are a synthesizer. Here's what I mean by that. You can take the emotions of a young man or young lady that you're working with, and you can create in that emotions an event 
which is the game. And then from the event, you can create a life principle, which changes them forever. So you can take the thing that they love the most, teach them a life lesson that they'll need the most at their most formidable ages. The world needs you. We need to be learning from you. We're not, you guys need to be infiltrating all of our organizations telling us this is how you should be doing it. Because the generation that we want to win, you're the ones molding them. And let me tell you, as a, as a college coach, it has been an unbelievable experience for me that as a head coach, I have seven guys who are currently high school coaches and one that just became an AD in the state of Florida. And I texted him this morning and I asked him this question. I said, Jeremy Oppenheim, he's Zephyr Hills High School in uh, Polk County, Florida. I said, Jeremy, why do you want to be an AD? This is what this young man texted me. He graduated this year. He accepted a job during COVID. He's a mixed race young man that accepted a job while there was a rally in the city he was going to work in. This is, this is why ADs matter so much, because this is what he says, to help as many young student athletes of all races get opportunities at the next level, as well as being able to be around all sports, not just basketball, and to help grow the next generations any way I can, and to show them that as a black man, we can also stand strong for everyone. This young man is 23 and he wants to be an A. He wants to be you. Do you understand the power in that? 70% of the prisons are young men who have dropped out of high school. I did a talk two weeks ago with uh, the Federal Bureau uh, of Prisons, the president of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and we were on a panel together. And I asked him this question. What's the solution for our black boys? What's the solution? And this man said to me, RJ, our athletes almost do a better job graduating right now. And the reason why is they have other people in their life who show them that they are valuable on a day-to-day -day basis. He said, what's unfortunate is that there is a population that don't play any sports and they don't get this affirmation. So the simple answer to me is, if we can graduate those 70% that are dropping out, our prisons of black boys will drop drastically if we can graduate them. So I want you to understand that the solution is on this Zoom. The solution. People keep asking me as a coach, what should a white man be doing in this scenario? And here's my response. Be loud in your space. Do something that is sustainable. Don't exchange your emotion for an emotional experiment. Here's what I mean. Monuments don't change the moment. So going to a protest, love it, do it. It's a great experience. But then on Monday morning, you have to leave the people in your space. So being loud in your space to me means this. If you ride bikes every day, when you ride your bike today and you're driving and you're riding by somebody's house and they're out there and they're barbecuing, slow down and smile. That's being loud in your space. If you are an athletic director and it's leading your, your coaches in your next meeting, go in there and just be loud about love in your space. Don't allow how somebody else's uh, influence in another area forces pressure on you to be something you're not. And here's why I believe this is, that's sustainable, is because we have to weave change into our life's cycle. We don't want to add this extra element of now I have to do this, now I have to do this, because there's something called the 10 to 20 and the 30. And this is from my own personal life experience, being involved in, in social activism, uh, since high school. Um, I wrote my senior thesis paper on uh, racial profiling. I went to the University of Puget Sound. We had a race and pedagogy conference and I was able to have lunch with Cornell West. And uh, I've been to the White House several times and spoke on some of these police brutality issues. And, he, and here's what I, I believe is the, the most dynamic thing about social activism and the issues that we face as leaders. I'm not talking to the 
to the people who are looking for, for, for help. I'm talking to the leaders and you're leading both black people and you're leading white people and you're leading of all races. So how, what is the best thing to do? It's called the 10, 20, 30. So after the major event, there are 10 days of extreme emotion and adrenaline where everybody is about the action. I'm going to do this. I'm doing that. We're putting out statements. We're, we're doing this. We're sending emails. We are aggressive. Like I'm doing this 10 days, Scott. Now the next 20 days is responding to what you just said emotionally. Okay. I just said this. All right. What, now, where is that in, where am I going to fit this 20, that, that into how I lead? Because I just said I care. I just told everybody, I'm for this, I'm for that. But then I look over my leadership, I look over my life, and I'm not seeing those things. So in that 20 days, two things happen. One, you can quit your statement. Or two, you can get in the trenches and figure out how you can add one of these elements into your life. Unfortunately, it becomes so daunting that most people quit in that 20 days. So the statement becomes a monument of, look, I'm not about that. I'm fighting for everything. Black Lives Matter, I'm with you. But then 20 days later, it's like, ah, I said that, but I, I still have a job to do. And then it's the next 30 days. The next 30 days after that is we wait for the next extreme issue to happen. And then we go back into that same cycle. When you know your why, you'll find yourself understanding that in the essence of every human that you meet, our conscious for being able to raise their confidence is in the hands of an athletic director, a coach, a pastor, teacher. We have the ability with our words to change their life. They are looking for us to lead. We have the chat over here. I want you to think about one of your coaches right now. Who could, need, who could lean on you the most. The best thing you could probably say to them is, I believe in you. I hired you because I know what your why is. If there's a coach that you know, and it's the sport, and it's a basketball coach, say it's my basketball coach, put in the chat, I believe in my basketball coach. And that's the person you're going to text today, and you're going to say, you know what, I believe in you. Why, why, why? I believe in you. When I was 13, I was at a basketball camp in Auburn, and a white guy said to me, I believe in you. He has no idea living in Hilltop and the drive to even get to Auburn, what it took for me to get to that gym. Did not think crying on Saturday because I didn't think I'd be able to get there. And then to look at me and say, I believe in you. That man was Fred Kroll, the founder of NBC Camps. From that moment on, I worked every single week of camp, eight weeks till I was 20. Started a camp in Italy, started a camp in London. Off of one phrase, I believe in you. So this is how I've weaved my extreme moment into my life. I can't tell somebody else's story. I tell mine. That's why I keep finding myself in front of educators. Because I know in the seat that you sit, walking in front of you, are the generation, the solution to what we're looking for. And all they need to hear from us is I believe in you. Not a strategy from a coaching book or just I believe in you. Because I'm telling you, when we push strategies on these things, it's like putting a foot of frosting on the best cake you've ever had in your life. I don't care how good that cake is, all the frosting in front of it just gets in the way. Right now in extreme times, the way to lead, the how to lead, is to at this moment in the now, Understand why you got into this and then go as hard as you can to connect to that why. That's, that's it. The world right now needs synthesizers. People who can lead and teach lifelong lessons 
from the 16 to 25 year olds doing something they love. Yes, I am a basketball coach. But I just, so, I just share with you a text message from one of my former athletes who was freshman of the year, his freshman year, who graduated uh, champion of his, of his uh, uh, conference back to back, who decided to go back to his home high school and become an AD. Not because the opportunity looked great, because he knows it with his why, he can find greatness inside of those kids. When you look yourself in the mirror, you've got to see how much power you have. So today you're getting your power back. This is not a workshop to where you're gonna go write two pages of notes. This is a workshop where your heart is opened up and there's a pen right on your heart and it's saying, get back to me, get back to my why, so I can do my how better, when, right now. Get back to my why so I can do my how better right now. The presence is powerful. I think I said it earlier. We get worried about our future, disappointed about our past, so we miss our present. That is the bend of 90% of leaders is because the presence is so powerful, we're scared of it. But that's the only place change happens. It's not in these systems that we're sharing. I'm telling you, those things are scalable and they work. But to be an extreme leader in extreme times, we've got to remove the layers that we put on top of our leadership. You got to remove those layers that we put on top of our leadership. The other box I have on there is the wave. The wave is this. So Jeremy Oppenheimer, the young man I told you about, the, during his sophomore year, um, he had some drastic things happen in his family. He had family in Haiti. He had family in uh, uh, Puerto Rico, and he had some drastic things happen that were happening in the world. Well, during that wave, he was able to come sit in my office, and we were able to just talk about life and about different things. And that's when he connected to his why again. We were able to do a fundraiser and send some food to Puerto Rico right to where his family was at. And we were able to do that just by him understanding his why. So that little ripple of him helping somebody that he knew personally by, by having a conversation with his coach, that ripple created a wave in his heart to where now his whole life is going to be, let me go do this every single day. This is so contagious. So right now we have an opportunity with the racial tensions, with the COVID crisis, there is a wave of emotions going on. This is an opportunity for you to say, okay, Am I, is this wave, this wave might have made me fall a couple times, but now I'm going to ride this thing because I know this is why I got into it. I am a surgeon of hearts. I am a surgeon of, of, of helping people understand motivation. I am a surgeon of happiness. I am the attitude director of my environment. And as you start riding that wave, look, your students going to watch you and be like, man, look at Cole. I want to be like him. And the reason they say that is because not what you do, not how you do it, but why you're doing it, it's contagious. It's contagious. And here's how I know it's contagious. Because in the last six or seven weeks, I've done this right here probably 80 times. Never in my life have I th would I think I would be doing that. But what I think people are starting to recognize is the layers of information we put on top of our why. Two more slides and I get out of the way. The unseen hours. This is what you guys do, man. You, you fill us up, but you go on E. So here's what I need you to do. Don't empty out your cup for us. Empty us, uh, fill us up from your overflow. So when you leave this call, you, man, you take some time for you. Put on a Zoom background like this or something and, and go to uh, say, you know what, I'm putting the Zoom background like this. Man, I'm, I'm at the beach today. And to sit there, get you a margarita and, at, and enjoy your powerful present because of what you have done. Take pause and say, man, 
out of 144 athletic directors, I, I was present today. Let me take pause. Because life has thrown us some setbacks. But we know what setbacks happen. Minor setbacks for a major comeback. Coach Kelly, you know, Isaiah Thomas used to use that all the time. And people would say, well, Coach, you think this racial tension is minor? No, 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 no. I'm not saying it's minor. I'm saying it's been here for a long time, and we've approached it the same way, and it's still here. We've approached it with systems and strategies, but we haven't approached it with the conditions of our heart. We brought speakers in, and we started diversity and inclusion, and we started these projects, but we did not sit ourselves down and say, if I'm contagious, what am I giving people? Am I giving them love? I'm giving them hope. So when you're on that beach today, I want you to be thinking about, how can I give this hope? How can I give that hope? Because when you do that, you get these mountain moments. And what I love about ADs is the mountain moments. You see this guy right here? You took the picture. You took the picture of the winning shot, of yeah, the, the winning touchdown. The, the winning cheer, the, the grand slam, you're behind the camera. That's how powerful you are because in 20 years, that's all they're going to want is the picture. And you're the one that gets to capture that. That is powerful. Extremely. This picture right here, it's two young men, Abu, Ray J. Abu is a refugee transferred to Boise State. Ray grew up in Chicago. We were down 18 points with three minutes and 20 seconds to go against Utah State. We got in a huddle and we looked at ourselves and we said, move the mountain. That was one of our phrases we had in the locker room. As you can tell, I'm a little bit wild. Move the mountain. We just start saying, move it. Be powerful right now. We came back, won the game in overtime. Down 19, I believe, with three minutes and 21 seconds. All the adults around us were so busy, and we know how this is supposed to come back. The strategy won't work. There's no coaching book that says you can do this. There's no coaching book that says you can come back from COVID. There's no book that says you can come back from, from uh, racial tension. There's no book. Move the mountain with your heart, the one in front of you. We get in that huddle. And the beautiful thing about it is our freshmen were the ones in the game. This young kid right here, Ray J, freshman, scored 19 in 3 minutes and 21 seconds. 19 in the Mountain West against the Mountain West champs. And we win the game. Biggest game and one of the biggest comebacks in one of NCAA history. What's interesting about that is when you're in that moment as an adult, if you forget your why, you don't even allow the kids to show you how they can do it. But I'm so crazy that I knew these guys got it. Just like I'm looking at you, 145 of you, and I'm saying, Joey Johnson, you got it. Mike Harris, you got it. Eric Titus, you got it. Jonathan Kelly, you got it. Pete Morrow, you got it. Tim Thompson, you got it. You got it, because you guys have these stories in your career. Justin Kessler, you got it. Debbie Bill, you got it. Jeff Chandler, you got it. And I know you got it. Because I'm coaching your kids. And they show up with power because one of you walked by them and it was a tough day in the office and you didn't take that tough day to that young person. You smiled at them and you didn't realize that started a ripple in their heart because they were like, wow. Jeff Chandler, that's all it takes. It's not going to be this pyramid of leadership or, and I believe in all those things, but it's funny how when, 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 when the bleep hits the fan, we show up. The book ain't there to save us. Strategy ain't there to save us. We got to show up. So I'm thanking you right now for showing up. I'm thanking you right now for showing up every single day. Last thing I'll talk about, and I think I took way too much time, I'm sorry. People ask me all the time, what do I do? What's the one thing that I do every single day that I think is like the most powerful thing that I do? 
in a, it's this thing I call the water, it's the water deal. It's my 15 minute morning, morning routine. And all I do is, and I'm gonna uh, stop this virtual background so you can see it. Don't laugh at my green screen, don't laugh at me. Um, so I take a water bottle and I write words on it. And I do that right before I go to sleep. And so today in my word, my bottle, I put contagious present. Breathe. Slow down and be willing to change. Put your notes away and talk to their hearts. You're not a paid speaker. You're going to go back and do what you have to do. This is your moment to connect to their hearts. So I wrote these down last night. And I put it right there next to my bed. And so I go to sleep thinking those things. Right when I wake up, open that bottle of water, boom, I start drinking it. Then I imagine what could happen if I actually am powerful in my presence. And then I meditate, or for some people it's prayer, whatever it is, solitude, quietness. But don't wake up and get on the treadmill of worry, which means don't wake up and go straight to your phone. Don't wake up and go straight to the issue because then now you're playing catch up every day. And you haven't even allowed your mind to say, I'm here with you today. You haven't allowed your heart to say, I got you. I'm telling you, I've been doing this for almost 16 years because I love to drink water. In my first, my, my first year at Southeastern University, we lost seven games in a row. And I'm walking up the stairs and I look at the recycle bin and in the recycle bin was a bunch of water bottles that reminded me who I was. Powerful. You're a man of integrity, hardworking. These are the words that I had on my bottle. It then told me, you know what? Every day now, I'm gonna park at the soccer field and I'm gonna walk through the entire campus during this losing streak. And I'm gonna be those words in my bottle while I'm losing games. And I'll walk through the entire deal, get to my office, breathe. Now it didn't help me win my next game. That's not the part of the story. The story gets better the next year. Now we're 27 and seven ranked third in the country and we just lost in the final four. And I'm walking campus the same way. And I had a teacher come up to me and say, what I love about you and your staff is I couldn't tell if you're winning or losing when you walk this campus. And that's when I knew I had become powerful in my present because I didn't want to let whatever was going on in the world the extreme nature of racial tension, the extreme nature of COVID. I didn't know whatever was going on in my world to take me away from eye to eye, heart to heart conversations. And so that's what I do. My last year at Southeastern, we were on a five game losing streak. I was walking up the stairs. Our school was a, it was a Christian school. So you could get suspended. You could be 21 and you had a drink and they found out they could suspend you for like three games. So that happened to a couple of my players that year. And so we're walking up and I see the water bottles again. And this time I decided to take them all out of the recycle bin and put them on my desk. So now players are walking in and see 30, 40 water bottles. They started seeing the words. We won eight in a row, conference championship on the road. We won a conference championship in Miami. A player who wasn't supposed to graduate, who's now playing professional, cut the nets down in Miami in front of his dad and his mom he hadn't seen in years across the street that he grew up in and ran away from. He's standing on the ladder cutting down the net and my AD took a picture. And it's one of the only pictures he has where his dad and his mom were looking up to him. And that's all he wanted in his life. You know how powerful it was for AD to do that? Powerful present. I apologize for the time. I, I told Suzanne, and I hope you know what you're getting into because I don't know how to be sure. I just know how to be me.
I texted Dave last night, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but this is, this is who I am. And I can't apologize for that. Um, I just want to give you me. So if there's any questions, comments, I love y'all because you guys are doing the work. Um, Dave, we could probably take some questions or we can go into the questions or whatever you want to do. I know I went kind of long. Well, I think we have plenty of time for questions. This whole <clears throat> today was about um, celebrating who we are and what we do. And I think uh, RJ, you just did an outstanding job of um, kind of defining purpose and kind of what we do and how important it is. So yeah, why don't we open it up? People have some questions for RJ. I'll ask a quick question of you, RJ. Um, just in light of, of uh, the events since Memorial Day um, with George Floyd and stuff, how has your life been impacted? And uh, uh, what kind of things have you seen uh, in, in Boise and beyond uh, with, uh, with the response to George Floyd's uh, murder? Yeah, the, people always ask me what was different about this one. And what I can tell them is what was different about this one, because I was in Florida with Trayvon Martin and I went down to his neighborhood and I walked with Trayvon's family and I was there. I mean, I went to the Sanford, Florida. So this is not, I've seen these situations and people say, what is different about this one? And I said, I think this one is different because people from all walks of life saw this image and realized I can't be okay with that. Up until that point, for me, in my circum circumference of influence, it had felt like a black man problem. That night, I believe it became our problem. We, we can't, and I tell us, I don't, I want to free the white man and the white lady from the guilt of not knowing what you don't know. So you can walk in what you do now know. But that guilt that we usually put on people is what is what is why people don't do anything. I think in this scenario, there were enough white men and white women that said, I don't know what's going on, but I'm grabbing this sign and I'm going to this today. And I'm, I'm just going to go. And then when the black men start seeing that, it's like, wait, hold on. There's a lot, there's a lot of white people here with us. So as much as people want to get, oh, this and that, Black Lives Matter, yeah, yeah. Martin Luther King's looking down on this thing and he said he wanted to see black men and black women walking, holding hands. Is that not what we see? When's the last time we saw that? So you telling me that this is an extreme moment? Yes. What have I seen in Boise? I've seen the president of my institution sit down with every black person in leadership and say, what do we do? Not how do we do it? So it went from a listening to a how versus in the past, it's not an indictment on anybody, but in the past Cole, what has been is the white leader saying, this is what we should do. Not ever touching the experience emotionally. And then when you say this is what we should do, we hear it as, but you don't understand. Programs, it's not what it is. It's not about programs. It's about what people feel right now. I talked to a church last week and I said, it's like we're on a tightrope and the black man's on the tightrope and he'd been on that tightrope for a long time. He's figured out how to stay up there. He knows he wants to get to the other side of that tightrope. The white guy's at the end of that tightrope. He's like, come on, man, get over here. You can make it. And he goes around his business. For, for some reason in the last, call, in the last couple of weeks, that white guy that said, I'm going to get on this tightrope. I'm going to walk across this tightrope. I'm going to get uncomfortable as hell. I'm going to shake. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to get emotional. The white woman's like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to lose some colleagues because I'm going to say this because this is what I feel needs to be said. But it's from my heart. So hopefully over time, my heart wins. And then I'm going to get to that tightrope. And then I'm going to get to that moment. And I'm going to hold that black man. And we're going to walk across this thing together. That's it. That's what I see. That's what I see. Thank you so much.
Suzanne, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I, um, RJ, as we, first off, you're amazing. So thank you for um, your time today. But as we go in and really take hold of our why, and then we go to educate our coaches, and we're in meetings and trying to educate them, one of the things that, like, I kind of grew up in the generation where you were not supposed to see color. Like, that was, like, in my 1980-ish um, time frame. How do we um, deal with the coach that says, well, I treat every kid the same? You, you would say to them, no, you don't. Um, and then I would say to them, um, take your sport out of it and realize that you are sitting at the edge of an edge of the island and you have 12 young people looking to you, wanting to know how to run your life because you're their coach. So at this point, you have to invest in their future more than their present. And so that means you have to be smart in your response, but you have to respond to it. And sometimes the best thing for coaches is to give their places, their players a space to vent aggressively because it is safe. And if I know I can give them that space, then I can figure out who on my roster is really feeling a certain type of way to then I can now go to them in private. But you, they, they have to know that you're going to listen and you're going to be emph emphatic listener first. What you don't want to do is jump to solution quick because that's what they expect. Oh, do this, do this, do this, read this book, watch this movie. No, just listen to them. Just listen to them. I would tell, I would tell our coach, and I, and I have told our coaches here because I met with our coaches here. Make it simple, simplify the problem all the way down to the human condition and just literally ask them the weirdest question is on the scale of one to five, where's your joy at? Okay, it's a two. Why is it a two today? They may not say anything. You know what, mine's a two as well because I'm struggling trying to figure out what's going on in the world. I'm here with you. When you're a two, I'm a two with you. I don't, I'm not trying to get you to a five. I just want you to be real with how you feel. That's it. We can't try to have these meetings, our coach, our coaches, to try to change our athletes to become happy today. That's not the goal. The goal is to feel and to be okay with that. There's no, there's no scoreboard for emotions. It's just it's not, it's not so, you know, you're not going to feel when you leave any of these meetings right now like you did a good job. You're not. Because we won't know until Jeremy Oppenheimer decides he wants to be an AD. That's what happens when you're AD and, you're, and you have to be in the shadows is your why. Sometimes you don't get to know where, what happened. But you also help them. But don't, don't, don't leave. And, it's, if, you have, and if you have a black coach and you're a white leader, just empower that coach by saying, you know, you hired them because you know their heart. So you, there's trust factor there. So I, I would say to that coach, however I can support you, I support you. For example, I can go to any protest march in Boise. I can support my players' mission. I can support their heart without approving of their mission. So if my players want to go do something that I don't agree with, and I love them, I'm going to take some criticism to show them I love them. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to go down to the march, and I'm going to stand there, and someone say, why are you here? You know why I'm here? Because that 18-year-old right there said he wanted me to come today. And I didn't question it at all. I just came for him. Him. If I can get that one right there, you see him? If he can be a better father because he knows I'm here for him, that's why I'm here. So you can say, oh, you this, you don't like to No, 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 I'm here for him. I don't know why you're here, but this is why I'm here. So support the heart without having to support their mission. And the biggest thing I think too is when a white person takes heat for a young black kid, we see that as a, a big sign of love when you defend us. So when you defend us, when they see their teacher, I mean, I'm telling you right now, there's young kids out there who are like, you see what my teacher was doing, bro? 
Like my teacher is real. And it's not because you get this in assignment, it's because you retweeted something. You'll be able to, you'll be able to teach that person as, as, as much as possible. But then on the flip side of that, you have to also understand we don't want to inverse the deal. We don't want to, 100 years from now, to have to say white men's lives matter. So we're not trying to reverse the scale. So you also have to make sure that you tell your the student athletes who are not black men that, hey, right now, is we're finding the identity that America has shaped for these black men. This is our time. So how can we help this issue? And just bring them along for that journey as well. They have been left out. I've, I've talked to some coaches who have forgot about their white players. And I, I, as a black man, I feel like I can say that. Um, so reach out to them and encourage them to, hey, go watch this. Educate them on certain things. Thank you, RJ. RJ, we have, oh, I don't know, close to 150 ADs on this Zoom call. And, you know, we've had up to 200. And this is the time of the year where everybody's kind of doing their summer thing. But I, I guess one of my questions would be, I mean, we, we film all these, we record these, and we will post this, and we will send this out to all of our ADs. But I'd also like your permission to send this to uh, to my colleagues at the national level, the other executive directors, um, I think this would be very worthwhile for, for them to have and to share and to have access to if you're okay with that. 100%. 100%. Dave, do we, if there's no more questions, do you want to uh, do the one word deal? Sure. Yeah, let's do the one word. Let's do the one word. Here, here's how it goes. So I've been doing these Zooms with uh, educators every Thursday night for the last couple of weeks. And uh, for the past six years, I was part of this company. I'm part of this company called Generation Wellness. And we, uh, we create videos for, for elementary kids and middle school. And, you know, I grew up with some with, with ADHD. So I, I, I try to reach out to students who have who are, who are facing some of those issues. And, um, and so I've kind of used a gift of making videos to, to, to help young people. One thing we've realized is if you put one word in the chat box, it could be pickle, it could be rock, it could be Flintstone, it could be spaghetti. You pick one word, I'll ask Suzanne to pick the, actually let's ask somebody who doesn't know me so they don't think that this is just like out of the blue. We'll go, uh, let's go, Colin Kushner, you there? We'll go Colin. Hey. Colin. Colin will pick the word for us. So we'll throw as many words as we can in the chat box and they can be whatever words you want. It could be football, soccer, tennis. I will take the word and I will make a motivational speech and for 60 seconds as we um, end uh, the chat. And I'm gonna go get my charger because my laptop's gonna die as you start picking your words. How we doing, Colin? You got one you like yet? What, what do you want me to do? So in the chat box, all I want you to do is pick one of those words. Any word you want. Any word you see. Okay. Uh, let's go with listen. And then now we're going to talk for 60 seconds about the word listen. Do you understand that the word listen also spells silent if you just move the words around? So to actually listen, we have to be silent. There's a reason we have two ears and one mouth, because we got to listen twice more than we speak. And then sometimes when we listen, we have to slow down, breathe. Because a lot of times when we're listening, we're listening to respond what we hear. But we need to listen so we can see what we feel. Oh, the anger right now, the anger right now. No, 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 you're not listening. He's scared. Oh, he's happy right now. He's happy right now. You're not listening. He's thankful. If we can learn to listen by being silent, I am telling you right now, you are being loud in your space. Because right now, all we're asking our teachers to do, all we're asking America to do is as a black man, just listen. And then don't be silent. Respond with that energy that says, we can, we will, because I believe in you. 
because earlier you put in the chat, I believe in you, coach, because I hired you. And now I'm listening to the, to the heartbeat of my athletic department, and I'm realizing that if I don't know my own heartbeat, how can I impact somebody else's? The word was listen. And after that word, Jeff Chandler said respect. And then Kevin said team. And then Darby said aluminum siding. You have to have a team of people that listen so you can respect. Because here's what I know about aluminum. It puts up something and it protects it. And it's on the side. And it's not the foundation. It's not the most important thing that you buy. But guess what? It's what's seen with the eye. And so it's what the young person is seeing. They're not going to see your heart. They're not going to see your mind. But they're going to feel and see your passion. And are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, you're ready. Take some time and make it happen. I'm Coach RJ Barsh. I'm trying to get my followers up on social media so my players can like me more. Follow me at Coach RJ Barsh on Instagram so I can have more followers than my players. That's my badge of honor in the locker room. Uh, I love it. I could do this all day. Is that Lance Dimbo? Oh, my goodness, the best shooter ever. Lance, I see you, brother. Oh, man, this is beautiful. Love. This is beautiful. I love y'all, man. I love y'all. I have another Zoom at 1030, so it's 1005 here. I'm going to jump off, uh, and this one's a radio announcer, so that should be fun. Thanks, RJ. Terrific. Appreciate your time. Uh, to do this on such a short notice, uh, it's just a, a testimony to uh, your servant's heart, and we, we appreciate uh, what you said. And um, uh, can, we, can I throw out your email address uh, if people want to send something to you? Is that okay? I uh, had a screen share here. Um, if we're going to, because if you, oh, I thought I had a slide that had it. That's okay. I've got it. If I have your permission, I'll just send it to everybody if that's okay. Everyone. Okay. Tonight we have the let's talk about it uh, with the teachers. Um, every single call has had almost 700 teachers on it. Uh, we record them. This one's going to be special because I'm bringing my grandma and my mom on. And it's uh, let's talk about it to the to the uh, educators and uh, the the title is these are my sons, and so my grandma who served in the military and, and uh, picked cotton, and um, we, our family was goes all the way back to Juneteenth. Uh, I did a research study and was actually on the news on Friday and figured out that uh, our last name was connected to a young man named George Dillingham who was in Sulphur Springs, Texas, and was, we were one of the 250 slaves that were let go was, was, was in my family. And so we're gonna talk about that on Thursday and how uh, you can impact education by helping young black men know their history. So that's on Thursday night. If you go to uh, my web, my Instagram, it says all the information to, to log on. And it's free, it's not, we're not charging for any of that stuff. That's what people get mad at me. It's like, I should charge, now I'm good. This is my heart, it's what we do. I love y'all. All right, Dave. Thanks, RJ. Appreciate it, buddy. Take care. Okay, everybody, to go along with uh, this is our last, our last uh, loss of Zoom. And one of our goals was to kind of celebrate who we are and what we are. And I asked everybody earlier to send, uh, to think about taking 30 seconds and sharing with us, um, with everybody, and we'll just do this for 15 or 20 minutes or as long as it'll go, about uh, something really positive and joyful that's happened at your school with your student athletes that you can uh, remember and you'd like to share with everybody. I just wanna kind of end our time together. This is, <clears throat> I think this Awasa Wednesday has really morphed into a social support network for all of us, you know. Um, so I think I'll start this. And if you look um, where I'm speaking from right now, I have a picture in the background. That's a picture of Sydney and I at Crater Lake. And I'm wearing a shirt. Actually, I'm wearing the shirt now also. It says Athletics Strengthens Education. And we gave that shirt out at our conference a few years ago. 
and some of you still might have it, I don't know, but uh, during that conference, a former student of mine, who's actually my family doctor now, had a chance to speak, and he told a story of uh, his seventh grade basketball team, a team that I was coaching, and we weren't very good, and I think our record, and I've, I've shared this story before, our record was five and five. We had five losses on the road and five losses at home. And we lost our first game 64 to four. And those four points might be the best coaching I've ever done to get those four points. In other words, we, we weren't very good. But I remember everybody on that team and after the first game, we had to regroup. We practiced every day at six o'clock in the morning when you have seven, eight, and nine at your junior high and only one gym, you had to find different times and that was our time. And we, developed our own little mantra and it was like it was just three things that we talked about that we had to get up we had to dress up and we had to show up and we lost all 10 games that week that year but um, when Mike Stevens who was on that team and Todd Whitman who does our clock hours he was on that team when Mike spoke at our conference he referenced that team and he referenced that team because when he went to med school his freshman year, he almost flunked out. And one of the things that he remembered more than anything when he was struggling was get up, dress up, and show up. And he says he learned how to persevere and he learned about resiliency. And those are the lessons that, that, um, that our student athletes learn and uh, it's something that will always be with me because every time I go into my office, he still calls me coach. And uh, that, <clears throat> you know, to me, that's just a, a moment that uh, reflects the power of who we are and what we do. So who else would like to, to share something? Just a little stint about something positive that happened at your school this this year. I got something. Sure. Um, so we we worked really hard on a drive-by graduation thing, and it was the most joyful day. The families pulled in at one end of campus. They did a tour through the whole campus. We had teachers along the way applauding. We had music. It was a total celebration and our community is saying why are we spending seventy five thousand dollars renting the arena when we can do this so personally and i think what we did is we rethought a tradition yeah. and now i think we can look at some of our other traditions in that same kind of light how can we make it more of a celebration and make it more personal and it was just the shot in the arm that all of us needed we'd had a tough spring with covid we lost a coach who died from cancer, it was awesome. So rethinking sometimes with making it personal and making it fun would be a big deal. No, thanks, Stace, that's awesome. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I thought the Friday Night Lights thing, Dave, went really well for us. Um, you know, the, the saying is definitely true when it comes to our kids and we notice Maybe you don't, I don't know, but distance makes the heart grow fonder, right? So we've been separate from our kids since March 13th. So, um, you know, having seniors and then even some underclassmen, well, seniors would show up to Friday Night Lights, but the underclassmen were jealous because they got to come and hang out and see us. And, and uh, a lot of our teachers started showing up. And so it just, it, it really truly, I think, brought joy to both people to have some social interaction with folks, even though it wasn't in a classroom every day, but, uh, really spoke to, to just how powerful, you know, this profession is when it comes to uh, being a solid person in a kid's life. Um, you know, we had another parade where our eighth graders were advancing up to ninth grade and kind of similar to, uh, to what Stacy said, they drove through our parking lot and, you know, these eighth graders, soon to be ninth graders, were just mortified that their parents were driving them uh, in their vehicles by our school and stuff. But, you know, to have our staff members out there screaming their name and waving at them and stuff, I think was, uh, was a true energizer for those folks. So I think when, uh, when we finally get back to school uh, in the fall and get to see people and see students, or even, you know, when summer sports start up, 
there's going to be so much joy and adrenaline and, and happiness. Uh, I think I saw somebody say, Don Farler said, some kids are puking and bone tired. Kids are never going to be happier to be puking and bone tired than they are now because <laughs> they get to hang out and participate. So that's, that's mine for sure. Yeah, nice. You know, in the midst of all of this uh, <clears throat> that we has so much anxiety about, it's funny how we've, we've gone from managing our programs to actually having to think a little bit more about our why and uh, how important our, our why is. Anybody else? I'll, I'll just take a, take a moment here. Um, I just want to share my story with how positive my students were in a, in a change. There was a change in the leader in the, there was a change in the athletic department where there, I became the athletic director in the middle of the school year and the student body, just the positive love, energy, acceptance of the change. And then it kind of trickled upward from the students to the coaches to the parents and just the joy of being able to walk into a gym or walk into wherever my students were performing and to see people's faces light up was it was a great feeling to know that hey change is not always bad change is change is part of improvement and just to know that my students love the fact that hey he's here to support me and that warms your heart and it goes back to what rj was saying a few minutes ago man if we just take the moment just to love and support the heart of our athletes it changes who those people are. So my hat's to off to all of you that do that on a daily basis. And I'm grateful to be a part of this fraternity of great people. And, and I think we, as we move forward, as we go forward from COVID, um, that we continue to lean on one another. So we take the positive message that we've taken from our Wasa Wednesdays and continue to share them. Thanks, Melton. Hey, Dave, I've got a quick, Dave, I've got a quick one here. Yeah. So uh, I've shared with a, a few of you on this call uh, it, our construction woes over the time. So we went uh, 18 months without a gym. Um, no, no locker room facilities, no PE facilities, no nothing. Kids playing their senior year over at um, Skagit Valley College and volleyball programs playing down at a uh, middle school and a few other things. And our uh, this past um, December, we opened up uh, two hours before our first game, we got the green light to go ahead and have a game in it. And just the joy on people's faces to see that facility back open and nobody cared what the score was at all. So it's just neat to have that energy back in our uh, facilities again. Thanks, sir. Hear a little noise in the background. That's my grandson's leaving after spending the night last night. We had some moments, believe me. I was Earlier I was talking about a real lesson I learned. We went out for a bike ride and I was showing them how I could jump the curb and I bit it and went down and they both start laughing. So there was a lesson there somewhere. Anybody else? I'll jump in. Um, so like Eric, we are currently in a construction woe. I have not had a gym since well, this time last year, it was taken down. We're building an underground parking garage to put a new gym on top. And so I knew going into the year, it was going to be a challenge to logistically to manage. Um, of course, the kids were upset about not having their space to play their games in. We were playing volleyball at St. Joseph's School, which is a little elementary middle school up the hill, and basketball. Um, we got to play some home games at O'Day, which was actually a huge highlight. That was a lot of fun. Um, so I think that through that process, we found a lot of this is goods and this is fun. And I think that has continued to carry over through COVID. Um, as a teacher, I also teach PE. I um, had to learn how to teach PE remotely and um, kind of got into the stride of things and had some fun with the kids. And, and right before spring break, we, our question of the day was, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? And that had such a big reaction from the girls. I actually wrote them um, invitations over spring break, mailed them to them, and we had our virtual ice cream party on the Tuesday that we came back. And that, you know, I saw a couple of kids recently, and they were like, that was so much fun, Miss London, can we have an ice cream party again? And I was just like, wow, that was such a little thing that made a huge impact. And um, I think that we're enjoying those 
let's take a pause, let's step back and reflect on things and how, how much joy certain items bring to us. And um, we've gotten to watch our gym go up. So I think that with all of this, you know, when we come back, we'll be closer to actually walking in there. And I can just can't wait for that big celebration when we get to set foot in there and actually celebrate and, and play our games that back there again. Thanks, Lace. I have one. At Sultan, we had a, a senior or a junior who came second state in Matt Classic last year and uh, certainly was focused on seeing it, it, during the senior year if he could improve upon that finish. And um, he's a football player, wrestler, and uh, his body kind of um, aches and pains. And there had been an ache in his foot and just blew it off as just another thing. In July, found out that he had cancer and uh, started the treatment. And um, I know that a, uh, he ultimately in October decided that the best thing to save him was to remove the foot. And the uh, week before, we had a football game at Cedar Park Christian and a student at Cedar Park rallied around and did a and, and uh, organized a fundraiser for our our kid. They had a yellow out represented the color of his cancer, and um, it was it was very touching to see, um, you know, a, a league, a school, a, a community within reach out to our kids and stuff. And then um, he was a twin, or he is a twin. And his brother has never wrestled since middle school. Um, he decided to wrestle this year and was not a wrestler, but was determined to improve. And um, in every tournament that our team was in, he never finished um, lower than fourth place and ended up qualifying at regionals to go to state. Goes to the state tournament and he ends up finishing in the top four as well, I think fourth. And um, that was a real special moment if, um, just to see that. And I know that our, uh, his, his brother is determined. Um, he ended up, because of his focus on his health, is not graduating, didn't graduate this June, and is determined to um, get out on the football field this coming fall and hopefully we have a fall that allows that to happen and and I know that he's also hoping to find himself onto the mat but it was um it's a special story and the story's not done thanks Scott appreciate it others yeah Tick I'd just like to share uh the true character of our girls here at Oaksdale um, for this uh, last year. Uh, number one, they allowed an old man to assist them in both volleyball and basketball uh, when they didn't have coaches that we could find. So I got to step in and it was a joy for me to be a part of those seasons. But I think what's, what really stands out for me is the character of them when it came to the success that they've had in the past. And this year they, again, had some very, very great success as academic champions in volleyball, basketball and also finished second place in uh, both those sports at the state tournament. But as I see as a uh, WI executive board member, when you hand out that second place trophy, a lot of times teams don't want it. They don't even want to be out there anymore. But our girls received it with grace. And then as the championship uh, trophy is awarded, stood by and applauded the opponent that we played in both the basketball championship and the volleyball championship. So they tried to smile through tears and I, th I thought they just did a great job representing our school and what they're all about. Thanks, Ken. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you that didn't know, Ken and I um, run the state B basketball tournament together and it was, I just can't believe how much fun it was to watch him coaching his girls at the state B and uh, how embraced they were by the whole community there. It was just a lot of fun, Watch, fun watching them and what they did and how well they were coached. And yeah, it gave a lot of people a lot of joy, not just from Oak Still. Anybody else?
Okay, well, let's end our time together. I just want to share one quick story, and then I'll let everybody go. Um, the foundation, when I first became an educator, uh, I taught for a few years, and then I went and became a counselor. So the majority of my career, I was the counselor athletic director at a junior high. And um, the very first professional growth opportunity I had, I went and listened to a speaker and I heard him say the following things. And this has really become, became my foundation. I think it's really the foundation of who we are and what we do and our platform in athletics. And what I heard him say that was this, he says, it doesn't do us any good to have our students turn out as 4.0 or the best athlete in the world. It doesn't do us any good if they're not good citizens. And that's what we do. We produce those qualities in our athletic programs, those foundations, that endurance, that perseverance, all of those things that we know shape character. You know, there's only one state champion, and that doesn't mean that everybody else hasn't had some successful moments in their journey. And that's what we do. And that's what we're, you know, as athletic directors, that's what our, our, our goal is. You know, we direct traffic, we encourage, we support, and we give people hope. And uh, there's never been, <clears throat> in my mind, a better moment to really embrace uh, our community as athletic directors in our vision and what we do. And uh, I appreciate everything that you, that you all do. I, I know that you're probably all working harder now than you've ever worked just because of the, the uh, not knowing when you're going to be there and, and all of the things that we've had to do, but hang in there, persevere. That's what you do. Um, take care of yourself. As RJ said, how important that is. Uh, take care of yourself, then you can take care of those other people under your leadership. And I wish you all the very best. Have a great summer. And we will kick up WASA Wednesday again in August. We're going to do something from new athletic directors. And uh, and I think later on in August, we're, we're going to have something for all athletic directors. And uh, appreciate your attentiveness and everybody being a part of this. And uh, thank you for all of our speakers and for Cole and for BJ and all the energy that they've put towards this. And, um, you know, as, as nice as this is and the social support network that we've created with this, I got to tell you, I am looking forward to seeing all of you either at the WA workshops or, you know, at our next WASA conference because uh, there's just something to be in face to face. And uh, the first round is on me. So enjoy your summer, take care of your families, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll all be back uh, for fall sports. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Tech. Thanks to everybody else. Cole, BJ? Yes, sir. Thank you guys. Hey Mick, BJ, there's anything? a question in the chat. There was one question in the chat about board meeting yesterday. I don't know if there's any WI updates. Yeah, probably the most significant one is the August 1st date being moved to August 16th uh, for schools that are late getting into phase two or if risk management's not allowing them to get to phase three. So we'll get some information out this week. Uh, Cindy's going to do a two minute drill and uh, Casey's putting together uh, written documentation so you can share it with whoever you have. So just start uh, thinking about um, if your school's interested and if so, what that would look like being able to continue instead of August 1st through Sunday, August 16th. And Tick and Cole and BJ, you know, I, I wanted to hear from ADs, but uh, what you've put together to bring this state together in this situation is phenomenal. And I really appreciate uh, how we have uh, tightened up the relationship and instead of having several independent teams trying to help kids and programs that we've become a much larger one team. And um, thank you for your leadership on making that happen. It's been awesome to be a part of. You know, just to reemphasize that, Mick, I don't think there's ever been a time that I've been aware of that we have felt more uh, in tune with each other. I mean, the power of we, um, you know, your leadership, 
uh, your staff. Um, it's we are we are moving towards working together, and that feels really good. And I think everybody wants to believe that we're all in this together, and we are. And we're, we're doing a lot of good things, and, and obviously this was one of them. And uh, your support, the WA support in, in doing this is um, looking forward for it to continue. You know, I, we're, um, we're doing some good things, and it feels pretty good. So thanks, Mick. Appreciate your leadership. I'll echo that, Dave, and, and thank Mick and BJ and Cindy and Justin and Andy and everybody on the uh, WIA crew for your transparency and your help. I mean, being able to answer questions on the fly when we don't know when we don't have information is uh, that's been that's been outstanding. But uh, I think just the transparency and the ability to speak to the group as a whole has been outstanding. Yeah. All right. Well, nothing better than. Uh, one song, I guess, to send everybody off. I hope everybody has a great summer. Um, yeah, and then we'll see you guys in August. <laughs>